Welcome back to the Identity Jedi Show. You guys know what it is. Another special episode coming live from Las Vegas, Identiverse 2024. And this next guest, oh, we are about to have a time. Because, I mean, first of all, there's, there's, there's always stories, but we'll get to the story of her and I in Vegas last year. It's not what you think, but it is a crazy story. But we'll get to that. So excited to have Courtney Hancock on the podcast. Thanks for having me, David. Yeah, thanks for coming through. I'm not accustomed to being in a professional setting with you. <laughs> Typically, we're just doing happy hours together, so. Pretty much. Happy hours are F1 races. That's right. Right? That's right. <laughs> A whole weekend of F1. A whole weekend of F1. So I actually, you know what? Let's let's start there. So this is let's let's do the origin story of the friendship that is Courtney and David, right? So I get a call from Jeremy Roars, like last freaking minute. I'm in Atlanta. He's like, hey, I need you to be in Austin like tomorrow. And I'm like, what? He was like, yeah, we have to go cover like this F1 race. I'm like, you realize how expensive like this is going to be? Like last minute going to Austin for F1. He's like, no, no, don't worry about it. Like we. We're the, we're the partnership. You're going to meet Courtney. I'm like, who is Courtney? He goes, you know Courtney. I was like, no, I don't know Courtney. He goes, oh, well, you meet her when you get there. I'm like, uh, okay. We had met in passing at various events. Okay. So like New Hampshire sex ed events. Okay, yeah, yeah New Hampshire is a different I was, right. I was trying not to be. I was on my best behavior for those. And I was trying not to be in Get Out the sequel. So I wasn't really focused there. So I fly in, fly into Austin, and then it's like we're on this, we're on this email thread, and he's like, they're at, where were you? That wasn't Flower Child. Like, what restaurant were Do you remember? There was a customer you guys were meeting at a restaurant. So I go meet you guys there, walk in. That, this is my, for me, this is my first time actually, like, meeting Courtney. And so it's like a Thursday. We're getting ready to do this F1 event thing. They've got, like, an Airbnb. Like, she's got her team there. I'm meeting, like, all these people for the first time. I'm like, okay, well, whatever. Let's go. Let's do this. And first F1 event, and from then, like, it was just a hell of a weekend, and we've just been friends ever since because it's like this woman is amazing, and she's cool to hang out with, and she always knows what the drinks are. I'm like, that's... Shenanigans and instigators, you know. It's just this <laughs> perfect mix. And then we'll get to, I, I'm going to save the Vegas story for last, or our last for Vegas story, because that, that, was, that was a whole ordeal. But yeah, so since it's one of the things that I also like, really enjoyed when like, like meeting you and getting a chance to kind of hang out more, was well, just like your perspective on things, like specifically like in the identity and expansion field, obviously that's the kind of field we work in. And one of the things I want to talk about today is just some of the trends that you're seeing, right? You know, the last couple of years, I've, I've been saying for a while, like, you know, identity has been ripe for disruption and we've started to see some of that disruption starting to, starting to churn and show its face the last couple of years. So talk to me about some of the trends that you're seeing. So I think some of the trends have been the same trends for multiple years and will likely continue to be so. So obviously the, the zero trust, biometrics, passwordless, yeah. everyone is you know, trying to make sure the user experience stays seamless while still increasing security. So those trends, I don't see those changing anytime soon. I'd, I'd say where we're starting to see shifts is, I, I would say identity has become commoditized at this point. And wow. much of that, you know, what used to be only point solutions, if you're going to a customer and you're trying to truly build a full identity program, you had to go in with a sale point, a Centrify, a ping, and bring multiple solutions together to really build a platform. And now everyone's going through mergers and acquisitions or creating their own extra pieces. Yeah. So all of those partners now compete to some degree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my IGA tool now does PAM. <laughs> Pam Light, it does some pieces of Pam. Right. But you know, often it's it's maybe not as much as, as a CyberArk might have done, but who's actually using the full suite of CyberArk pieces? I would dare say very few organizations truly use everything. Right. So sometimes a Pam Light is is enough. And so we're definitely seeing more and more point solutions turning into platform solutions. Certainly pros and cons to that. But I think with that has come a lot of merger and acquisition fatigue on the customer side of yeah. the house. Some people appreciate it, some don't. But I think that's definitely one of the, the trends I'm seeing right now is people are concerned, are, are you planning to go private? Are you planning to merge with anybody? They're starting to ask those questions right. when they start looking at a new solution. And I think that's why. That's, uh, you know, that's interesting. And I never thought about that, that side of it, you know, from a customer, like being worried about Basically, now the stability of a company, right? It, it, before it was, I felt like we saw this wave in identity where it's like we saw a bunch of startups, so customers were like, hey, like 
are you going to have funding next month? Like, hey, that roadmap that you said, are you still going to exist? And now it's more like, it's, it's kind of that same question, but now it's like, are you going to be a bigger company? Are you going to be going private? Like, what's going to change with you, right, before I kind of make this this investment? And, and I've been, you know, talking about it the last couple of weeks, like, the, the whole partnerships and, like, basically frenemies thing now, right? It's like, so all of a sudden, your IGA and your PAMS will all offer kind of similar things. And so it's like, for those parts that don't quite work, right? So your PAM tool does some IJ stuff, but not quite enough. Or your, your IJ tool does some PAM stuff, PAM stuff, but not quite enough. And you go, oh, okay, well, we'll just go integrate. Like, are they gonna integrate now? Like, because it's, it's, it's that question that like, I'll, I'll like, so point Cyborg, right? That relationship has always been great. They've had a great partnership. I don't see any reason right now that that would change. But as they continue to start eating at each other's you know, market, it's like at some point that may change. And it, I don't think they'll ever go completely enemies, but I think we'll start to see kind of like, hey, we're going to come here, you're going to come here, and we're just going to integrate based on standards and be like, yeah, okay, customer, you figure out everything else, right? Because it's like, how do you, it's going to be interesting to see how they now compete and partner in this market when literally everybody does everything else. We're definitely seeing more and more of it in a lot of those partnerships where you used to be, if you were going to host a happy hour, you could say, we're going to bring in these three vendors right. to work with, and now you can't do that because they step on each other's toes too much. Right. The flip side of that is a lot of these companies are getting so large, the customer experience is also shifting. In, in the words of my grandmother, uh, some of them are getting a little too big for their britches. So the customer experience is not what it used to be. Mm. So I think. One of the things that has surprised me in the past year is that a lot of customers, even big Fortune 50 type companies, um, they're no longer looking for the Gartner favorites, the big Goliaths of the group. They want to know who's the startup in the space or really? you know, who's the European company that's coming over trying to make a splash in the US. Because if they can work with those guys, they're smaller, they're more agile, and they just have a better customer experience because if you're a big logo at a small company, you get a lot of yeah. extra attention. A lot of, lot of extra attention, yeah. And that's, that's actually really interesting. I didn't think about the you know, you know, overseas coming in and, and trying to you know, expand out the US market. That actually gives me, gives me some thoughts, some ideas, some things I want to go check out. I've been here. It's funny, I was uh, talking to a couple of guys when I, when I got here on Monday. Sensegura, one of the, the PAN platform, right? Big in Brazil, looking to do the same thing, trying to make a, a play to come out here in the US. And so, I, me personally, I love seeing how competitive this market is now, right? Like I think for the customers, you now truly get, you're going to get the best out of all of these companies because they now actually have to compete, right? For the vendors, it, it you know, kind of sucks, right? A little bit. I, I won't say it sucks. I think competition is always good, but it changes because this market's been so stale for so long, right? It was like two or three companies and that was, it, it was the same two or three. It's like, okay, well, you're going to go here. And now I think it's, it's an easy 10, right? That I can just right off the top of my head, and there's probably 10 more that I just don't know about, I don't hear about, to your point, that are smaller, that can really kind of come in, service a customer, right, and build super quickly. I, I'm looking at, like I look at Veza, Conductor One, Lumos, Clarity, like all within the last couple of years, like how fast they've been rolling out features, how big they've been getting, like it's, yeah, man, it's, I don't know if I want to be a vendor right now. Right? It's, it's... I, I'm glad I'm not, I'm glad I get to be vendor agnostic. <laughs> I, every so often I think, oh, I could go back to the product side of the house. And right. then I just think about what that life used to be like and how much more competitive it has gotten. Yeah. I think I'm good. Yeah. So. Uh -huh. What are, talk to me like it, some of the conversations you're having with customers, right? How, as they look at this, you mentioned, you know, kind of merging acquisition fatigue, right? They're asking different questions now, like, hey, like, are you guys going to private? Where are you going to be? Like, how do they feel about the whole move to platform? For the most part, have you seen customers like, hey, this is great, it helps us, or they're just kind of like, ah, I don't know. It's definitely a mix, because I think a lot of them have experienced beta rollouts that maybe were rolled out before they were ready to be rolled out, mm -hmm. and so they don't trust the new things that are coming out. Or when the mergers happen, they have experienced that clunkiness that happens when you bring on a new solution and you pretend it's one platform, but in fact it's built on two separate codes, and they don't talk to each other that well. So. There's tons of folks that have gone through that experience, and I think they are hesitant. Um, but then there's others, you know, it, it's easier to have one solution and one vendor to pay, yeah. one throat to choke, you know. Um, 
but I, I'd definitely say it's mixed. Uh, there's definitely some hesitancy right. with some people, but not, not across the board. I think the ones of, uh, who have been in the industry for a while are more hesitant than those who are just getting into it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. The other thing is now you can't just be an IGA professional. You have to do the full suite. So yeah. I think that's fine in this field. Most of us are nerds and love learning new things and expanding our knowledge base. Yeah. So I think most of us are fine with that. But some people, you know, are just PAM SMEs or just access management SMEs. Right. They don't want to do everything else or they feel that their jobs are in jeopardy. So. Right. Hmm. Yeah, and now, I mean, I think as, the, as it grows a little bit more and more customers take on these platforms, right, it's going to become you know, necessity to learn this. Because I think one of the, the value props, obviously, one of these vendors would pitch is, hey, like, again, one platform, right? So when you, now when you, were, when you want to roll out PAM, no new training, right? It's right. the same platform, right? You know, access management, we got that included, right? Although, like, I haven't seen, I guess you could Octa to, to an extent, right? Because technically they have IG and PAM, right? I haven't seen too many, like, access management kind of fold out platforms with the PAM and, and IG, but I, I'm pretty sure that's coming. Like, I would not, I would not be surprised within the next 18 months to see one of these big, you know, PAM vendors or IGA vendors go and jump in and throw out an IDP and create some of the access management stuff, right? Um, I, it, it's going to be interesting to see like how the practitioners take to that, how they look to learn across the different skills. Because here's the thing, like, although they're related, they are kind of completely different skill sets, right? And so it's going to be interesting to see the way the, the vendors, one, create the, the platforms and the features for customers how much they water down like the individual ones, right? Like where it's like, hey, it's not, it's not Pam as you know, it's maybe done a little different way. Maybe water down is not the, the best way to put that, but how much they change from the current, which means now your practitioners, your, your customers who are installed or who are running this kind of have to grow this different skill, skill, skill set and think about it a different way, which is going to kind of bring a lot of change, which, you know, people don't deal with change well. That's true. So. I mean, I think that's, we're seeing probably a shift away from some of those on-prem solutions to SaaS. A lot of people are not happy about that because they've customized their on-prem solutions so much. It's essentially a legacy home-built solution at this point. Right. I mean, the cost to upgrade and maintain is astronomical, which is great for me on the consulting side, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I would never recommend it at this point. Uh, but now moving into these SaaS platforms, it's, it's so much easier to maintain. You don't need nearly as many people. Right. Um, or nearly as many dollars, ideally. That's debatable, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but there's definitely a shift towards that, too. And speaking of you know, people adverse to change, I think those are the ones I'm seeing that are most hesitant to move. Mm. The ones who got really comfortable with their legacy on-prem solutions, and now they're being forced to these SaaS platforms. And a lot of them are not particularly happy about that. Right. They lose a lot of the flexibility. They lose a lot of stuff that they want, even though they get you know, supposedly, you know, more efficiency, less things to do. So, you know, you kind of touched on a point there, right? It, it's as we look at the move to SaaS, and it's definitely, I mean, it's been, it's been on this, this track for a good couple of years now. And I think it's, it's now, I won't say picks up a head of steam, but I think it's now more so the thing, like where most people are like, oh, we're thinking about, thinking about it. It's like, for the most part, everybody's kind of moving at this point. And now, like with some of the, the, the platforms and the vendors kind of go in SaaS first, we are seeing kind of, theoretically, but in some cases we are like a shrink in the services needed, right? right? Around that. And so I think now the 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 wrapping around how you deliver a service to a client is less about, hey, let's get you as many bodies as we can and, and get these hours. It's kind of more about let's get you just enough of the support you need and it's less of us to help you get up and running because most of the stuff the, the the applications kind of do now. But it's more like what do you do with this now that you have it? Like hey let's make sure you're going in the right direction. How are, you, how are you guys looking at that when you're talking to these customers about, hey, if they're going all SaaS platforms, like how is that changing maybe some of your approach to how you're dealing with them and like kind of giving them that support? I think if anything, it's easier to sell it up the chain and get money for it because you have such a faster return on the investment that you can say, you know, like this will be going in six weeks, you know, in another eight weeks, we'll also have this part and another, you know, eight, 12 weeks, whatever, we'll also be doing this. And so that's a lot easier to sell than, hey, in a year, maybe we'll have this rolled out <laughs> and it will do what we've been doing in spreadsheets <laughs> our whole lives, you know? <laughs> so there's definitely, it's, it's such a faster return on investment that I think it's a lot easier to sell to the board. It's a lot 
it, it, it's a lot more, how do I say, not cheaper. It's just not as costly to maintain it and upgrade right. it, and your patches are done almost immediately. So there is security that comes with that. Whereas if you have to manually update and patch everything, and that can sometimes cost millions of dollars for some of these larger tools, that's, that's really hard to justify keeping yeah. that in your budget. Okay. So, and then obviously license cost increases every time you renew, so. <laughs> of course, right? I mean, capital's exciting, we all gotta make that's money. Right. Right? That's so right, that's right. All right, so overall, you look at the direction of where the identity if she's going, Excited about it? Nervous about it? Very excited about it. Very excited about it? Yeah, I think, I think we're going to have a lot of new things coming down the road. We're, we're already seeing a little bit of a shift in AI. AI has been part of identity for quite some time, if only on the machine learning side of the house. Right. Uh, when you go to provision someone, you know, they got a risk score or something like that. So we've had AI in there, but I think AI is going to continue to just increase efficacy across the IAM tools that people already have and just make that a more reliable tool to some degree. There will be pieces that are automated, but pieces that we will always need people for. So we've got that coming down the line. We've got you know so much innovation coming. I'm curious to see what it will bring, yeah. but you know there's there's definitely things coming down the pipe. Well, I, I like the I've I like the direction they're going with the newer technology of the AI. Right to your point, it's it's been an identity for a while, but it's more the machine learning aspect. I do kind of like the the co-pilot esque features that I'm seeing from some of the vendors and what they're doing. I'd like to see them develop that a little bit more, right? I, I get they're, they're just grabbing for the most part like the, the typical chat GPT models and things like that and doing some things like, hey, we can make smarter suggestions, stuff like that. I get it, take the low hanging fruit. But I'd love to see come out of this as building some models specifically geared towards identity, building LLMs that kind of really speak the identity language understanding more about that data and then really seeing that what we can do with that, right? I think we'll start to see some of the things of truly creating, you know, automated roles and deep entitlement analysis and being able to kind of make these smart policies and adjustments based on the data that's there because right now it's still been so hard for customers to do that because there's just so much data to dig through and they don't, don't really understand how it maps. And so that's kind of where I'm excited to see, hopefully see some, some some advancements with AI coming in. The identity we'll vendors. see how that goes. We've also got now there's capabilities where you can um, bring your own identity, so your identity is stored on a private blockchain, and you bring your own identity. I'm curious to see where that could potentially go. I'm curious about that one too. I feel like decentralized identity took like they kind of had their hype cycle of the. It was like a couple of years ago. It was like it was a thing. It was a thing, and I right. just I was like, okay, we're gonna see how this goes in enterprise, and then it Everybody's kind of went away. Blockchain, and then right. No one's using blockchain. Well, not that they're not using. Right. It. You don't yeah. Care about it. Exactly, you don't care about it as much anymore. So I think the hype cycle changes. So it'll be interesting to see if it comes back with that. So, all right. Good stuff. All right. We got to tell the story. We got to tell the Vegas story from last year. This, okay. is, this is just, so it's, <laughs> oh man. It starts, first of all, as everything should in Vegas, it all starts with secret pizza. That's right. Right? I mean, that's, that's, all, I feel like half of our stories do start at Cosmo in some way, yeah, shape, or form. Yeah, pretty much. It's, <laughs> I don't, I'm starting to wonder if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But So we go grab some secret pizza at Cosmo. We go sit down. It's a group of like 12 of us. Yeah, it's a, it's a big group, right? So we're sitting there because we're all just, you know, probably all been drinking like way too much. We need some good pizza because that's what you need, right? We're sitting down eating pizza, and, we, and then we're leaving there and going down to... What is the name of the speakeasy? Barbershop. Is it, it is barbershop, yes. right? So we're going down to barbershop, go do some karaoke, right? So we finish the pizza, walk down, we get in, we sit. As soon as we sit down, I was like, oh shit, where's my phone? So I'm like, crap, must have left it upstairs, right? Secret pizza. Go back upstairs, phone is gone. Like, I don't know who this person was, if they were just like watching me the entire time, because I swear, it was only like 10 minutes between the time we got downstairs and back up, but... At that point, the phone is gone. So I come back down. I sit next to Courtney on the couch in the barbershop. And I'm like, yeah, somebody took my phone. And she is like, what? Like, OK, we're going to find it right now. Turn on your location. So I log in from her phone, track the phone. We can see it moving where somebody's at. I'm like setting the settings on the phone. Like, hey, give me a call back. Come get the phone. I'm like, all right, well, whatever. It's gone. But no, Courtney's like, no, it is not gone. It is not gone. <laughs> we're going to track this person down. and We're going to go get this phone. We spend the next good hour, right, tracking this phone, 
trying to go find it. We're watching it go from like Cosmo to Bellagio, right? right? Like, and I'm like texting the person, puts up on the screen. We're tracking it. We're talking to security. And I was just like, okay, this is number one, amazing that you were just like so dedicated to helping me find this phone. I was there to be your security when you did find the person. Exactly, because then we had the conversation I was like, okay, Courtney, what exactly are we gonna do when we find this person? <laughs> but it was just, I, I, will, I will remember that forever, mostly because the next day I had to go buy another phone, but also I just love the dedication. I feel like that solidified our friendship at that point, Courtney. I was like- I was ready to throw down for you, so. I was like, Courtney's ride or die, like we're, we're, we're in this, so. Well, this year I just won a skateboard at the at Dinoverse conference. Okay. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it, how I could possibly get it home. I'm probably gonna leave here looking like Richard Bird last year. <laughs> but I feel like there will definitely be some stories coming out of this show as well. Sorry, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> he, he put it out there publicly already. So. He did put it out there publicly, uh, but that, yeah, that sucks. So you, wait, how did you win a skateboard? Oh, it was one of those, you have to try a key in the lock. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. That's dumb. No one ever wins. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so did you skateboard over here, though? No, I did not. Or do you know how to skateboard? Uh, I, I once upon a time <laughs> did. It has probably been 20 years, though. Okay. So let's, let's, not, let's not talk about time. Let's, let's not learn how to skateboard in Vegas, then. I don't, I don't think that ends well. It could be fun. Could be. We could have good stories for it's next just, year. That would be a good story for next year. Listen, we don't want you to end up like Bert, though. That was... The goal know. is not to end up like Bert. The goal is not to end up like Bert. Let's all keep right. all the teeth. We're going to wrap it with that. Courtney, thanks so much for coming by, being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. As you guys know, you know what to do. Go check out TheIdentityJedi.com. Subscribe to the newsletter. It comes out every couple of weeks, Wednesday, into your inbox. Make sure to like, rate, subscribe on all streaming platforms, wherever you're watching this on, wherever you're listening this on. It goes a long way. And until the next time, you guys know what it is. Be good to each other. Be kind to each other. Love each other. We will see you guys in Vegas with no skateboards.